Today, I'm headed to an event in Columbus, Ohio at the Ohio History Center. It's called The Best Years of Our Lives, and it's meant to portray a small town late in 1945 where soldiers are returning from World War II and civilians are returning to their normal lives after the war. This is a lot different from the normal events that I go to. I'm used to going to events where they're portraying combat or at least portraying the lives of soldiers fighting in World War II, but this covers something that you don't often see covered in reenactments. I've never been to this event before, and if you couldn't tell by what I'm wearing, I'm not doing a 1940s impression or anything. I'm really interested to talk to the reenactors there and just get an understanding of what the event's all about. Today is Veterans Day as I'm going there, so a pretty fitting day to think about what World War II veterans were going through when they were trying to assimilate back into normal life after fighting in the war. Once I showed up at the Ohio History Center, I saw they had this little village set up right next to the main museum. Right away, I was surprised by the scale of this event. I was expecting some small buildings with storefronts, but I didn't expect a full village set up like this. As soon as I walked through the gates at this event, it was just like stepping back in time. What really sold this event for me was there weren't just displays set up with people to guide you through them. It felt like the town was actually alive like it would have been in the 1940s. All the reenactors were were just going about their daily business and it felt like I was taking a step into their life. Once I walked into the town I was greeted by Lucas Smith, the event coordinator, and he was kind enough to welcome me and all of you guys to the event. Welcome to the best years of our lives at the Ohio Village at the Ohio History Connection in Columbus, Ohio. We are portraying November of 1945 as a lot of GIs are coming home from Europe and the Pacific. This event was really based off the movie The Best Years of Our Lives starring Dana Andrews came out in 1946 which details the experiences of GIs and sailors coming home after World War II and that's really what we try to encapsulate with this event. World War II wasn't all about combat, wasn't all about shooting at each other. After the war was over, these people had to go on with their lives and that's what we're trying to portray here. After I got a rundown from Lucas on what the event was about, I walked further into town where I ran into a familiar face shining a young lady's shoes. Some of you may remember Edgar as the sergeant who administered my PT test in a recent video. So let's hear what he's up to now that the war wrapped up. Today I'm out here representing a returned serviceman. I've been back in country for a couple of months working at a local electric and general goods store. I'm originally from El Paso, uh, so obviously a little bit of my clo civilian clothing is very Western inspired. A more western style hat, western uh, outdoors kind of that uh, cowboy boots. Wanted to represent Mexican Americans and their culture and their fashion that was brought into uh, through the 40s because you know it's very interesting to me. It's what I am, it's who I am. The contributions of Mexican Americans were countless, over uh, 300,000 served during the war. So I'm just portraying a returning serviceman moving from El Paso to Ohio. Before the war I was a uh, cobbler. I come from a long line of shoe repairmen and shoemakers. And so, you know, today I'm out here, obviously, uh, <laughs> selling my services. Right now I'm running uh, two services, a standard and a premium, 10 cents and 20 cents. You know, shoe shining really hasn't changed all too much in the past 80 years, so uh, keeping this art form alive, you know. I let Edgar get back to his work and kept walking around town, but I could tell that there was some trouble brewing. I knew that that gentleman walking by with a baseball bat behind Edgar wasn't a good sign, and before I knew it, an angry mob of striking steel union workers came into the town center to demand their wages from the bank. <laughs> I got 
I really need to do unwind a bit after all that excitement, so I followed the sweet sound of swing music into this building, where a very talented group of musicians were playing period music, as many people from the town were swing dancing and enjoying the tunes. Honestly, could have sat in there and listened to that music all day long, but there was so much more to see around town, so I got to it. My next stop was this hotel, which was fully decked out with 40s stuff. I mean, the level of detail in this place was incredible, and it was even complete with a bar where some of the townsfolk were just wrapping up after enjoying a drink. Next, I stumbled across a scoutmaster's house where he was preparing for a camp out with his Boy Scout troop. This gentleman was extremely knowledgeable about the history of the scouts and the equipment that they used in the 1940s. He told me about how World War II equipment was often repurposed and used by the Boy Scouts after the war. And he even said that one gentleman who strolled into the house that day had actually been a Boy Scout in the 1940s and got to talk to him about some of the gear that he used and some of the experiences he had. Once I left the Scoutmaster's house, I came across a small celebration that was starting to commemorate the Marine Corps' 170th birthday. In modern time, the Marine Corps' 248th birthday was the day before this event, so some of the reenactors who are Marines in real life put on a small traditional celebration. To all officers and enlisted personnel, I wish to extend greetings and congratulations on the occasion of the 170th anniversary of the Marine Corps. Our first piece of cake will go to our distinguished guest. Petty Officer First Class Johnson, who fought with the Marines on Bougainville. After that, I stopped into an electronics store where they were selling the latest in radio technology, and I was also welcomed into the home of a widow who lost her husband in the war and was trying to move on the best she could. I lost my husband, unfortunately, and I'm here trying to make a new start. So please feel free to take a look around. I'll be happy to ask any questions. Yeah, excuse me, I put on my house slippers. I've been in heels all day. <laughs> then I came across this small building where civilians and military personnel alike were stopping in to get their portraits taken. A friend of mine named Mitch was helping to run the establishment, and he was kind enough to give me an overview on some of the camera technology of the time. So obviously we have our, our photo studio set up here. We've been doing great work all day, getting a lot of photos. And my preferred workhorse for everything I've been doing has been the Contax 2 camera, which was first developed by uh, Contax, which is a subdivision of Zeiss itself, which still makes lenses and glass products today. And um, this was considered state of the art for 1936 whenever it came out and it beat out Leica in one thing that they didn't have that this camera does. And whenever you look through your aperture in the rear, not only does it work for your range finder, but it's also your viewfinder if you have a 50 millimeter lens on it. So that way, as long as you have your settings adjusted ready for whatever exposure you needed, you could easily look through and adjust on the fly. Now, however, the, the shortcomings of having a range finder camera like that is you can't tell what's going on directly through the lens like modern cameras do, like with your phone or with the video that you're taking here, you'd be able to see what's exactly in frame. What we have to do instead when we change lenses on the older contacts cameras like this, because this viewfinder is only good for 50 millimeters, we wouldn't be able to see what all would be in frame if we were to change our lens to, for example, this 85 millimeter portrait lens. So that's where they came up with this carousel on top of it. This is to adjust to a different lens to have a viewfinder that's appropriate for your focal length of lens on it. And currently right now we have ours set up at 85 millimeters for our 85 millimeter lens, but you could adjust this to whatever lens you would need. Now it's at 135, back to 85 and so on. But this complicates things just a little bit for an extra step because now you get your range through here but then in order to make sure that you have everything that you need to in the shot, you have to look through this top piece here to get your shot in order. For the 1930s, this was state of the art. That's your best that you've got for 35 millimeter cameras in the late 30s and early 40s. Even so much so, Robert Kappa took one of these with him on Omaha Beach whenever he shot his famous photographs that he was there for. 
I saw some fellas tossing the pigskin in the town center, and after watching that, I made my way over to a few buildings I hadn't seen yet, including the bank, a clothing shop, which had all the latest styles circa 1945, a small bakery, and even a VFW hall where I was able to chat with a veteran of the First World War who helps run the place. He told me about how it's typical to have items brought back from the war on display in the VFW hall, and he showed me a couple of the items they had from the First World War, like this trench knife, trench club, and some other period equipment. Next, I made my final stop of the day at the Service Women's Center, where a reenactor named Molly was able to teach me all about what the female veterans returning from World War II experienced when they came back from the war. So welcome, we are representing the Service Women's Center, um, similar to one that would have actually been located here in Columbus during World War II. Uh, the one that was here in Columbus was located at the Hotel Chittenden, and it was part of a series of service clubs that operated across the United States and including Hawaii, which was a territory at that time, and they only were open and available to women of the Allied forces in uniform. And it was kind of filling a gap that had been created. The USO and the Red Cross, while officially supporting the women's services, uh, had some, some social pressures that maybe made them not as welcoming or supportive as they were to GIs. So um, you start seeing these service women's clubs come in, and uh, it's a place for a woman in uniform to come spend her day off. It's a leisure space. Um, if they had a hotel attached, they could stay for free or discounted rates overnight in the hotel. They had magazines, obviously teas and food, um, letter writing services. But one of the coolest things they had were their powder bars uh, sponsored by Elizabeth Arden. Uh, and she created specific makeup shades geared towards um, matching the women's uniforms. Uh, she put out a book on the double that described suggested hairstyles and makeup combinations uh, based off of what branch of the uniform you were. So if you were a WAC serving with the Army Air Forces, they recommended the top flight hairstyle. If you were a member of the U.S. Marine Corps Women's Reserves, maybe your hairstyle would be more like Geronimo, and you'd have the Montezuma red lipstick as opposed to a dusty rose that would maybe be better for a wave with her navy blue uniform. Uh, so thousands of women visited these um, during the war, and uh, they went from serving as a spot for active duty women to a liminal space as women are coming home from overseas or just leaving the military itself. Um, we had veterans organizations that were not open to women as veterans. The VFW flat out would not let women join. Um, they could only belong as an auxiliary, so a wife of, a mother of, a daughter of, a veteran. No matter what their service was or even if they had served even longer, uh, the American Legion didn't have such a formal restriction, but they weren't welcoming to women. So much like the women's clubs of the 19th centuries or ways women in patriarchal societies have been doing for ages, they are finding ways to create their own support networks and carve out their own spaces. And in the 1980s, the WAC Veterans Association finally got formal federal recognition as a veterans group. So they are on the same status as the VFW, as the American Legion now. Um, and it's all coming back to things like the Service Women's Club and ways in which women are trying to support themselves because they're not getting the external support they need, like the men. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed learning about this stuff as much as I did because I found this to be so interesting. I've said many times on my page that going to reenactments feels like you're stepping back in time, but this event really captured that feeling for me more than any other. As always, make sure to like this video and subscribe for more content like this. If you enjoyed this video, you're probably a history nerd like me, and that means you'll love all my merch designs. So go click the link in the description right now to order some of that merch for yourself. It really helps support my page. But with that out of the way, Thank you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Three.